Okay, today, um, last time uh, we've been talking about electrostatic plasma oscillations with no magnetic field, and then electromagnetic oscillations, which means we have a B tilde. But what we want to go on to now is to talk about uh, plasma oscillations of various types in a magnetized plasma. So uh, oscillations, and actually we'll derive dielectric constants, it turns out, so oscillations uh, in a magnetized plasma. Now, the first, you might say, complication that we need to discuss is, is a matter of, uh, let's call it terminology. And the problem is that we'll have um, directions, okay, like in the direction of the K vector or against that direction. We'll call those, it turns out, transverse and longitudinal. And then we'll have directions along the equilibrium magnetic field and perpendicular to that. And we'll call those parallel and perpendicular. And then it turns out the electric fields may be in the direction of B or not, and those will be called ordinary and extraordinary. So I just need to write down <laughs> all this bit of terminology. So the basic idea is relative to the magnetic field, we will define directions which will be perpendicular and parallel to the equilibrium magnetic field B naught. So this will be called, you know, perpendicular. We'll, we'll use that subscript a number of times. And of course, this is my parallel. Now, on the other hand, relative to the waves, uh, we will have so-called longitudinal waves. And what that will mean is that the electric field, the perturbed electric field, the oscillation or something, will be parallel to the K vector, okay? Or we will have transverse, which would be that uh, basically it's perpendicular the electric field is perpendicular to the K vector, hence E dot K is equal to zero, or we could say that K is perpendicular to E. Now, notice we could have used a designation of parallel and perpendicular for the waves as well, but, you know, as a matter of keeping uh, what we're talking about straight, it's better to use perp and parallel only relative to the equilibrium magnetic field and then use the words longitudinal and transverse to tell us the types of electric field um, um, vectors we're interested in. Now, there's one other characteristic that we'll have to come back to uh, later, which is basically that the way we still haven't specified everything, and those two wave characteristics are something which are called ordinary modes. And these will be ones for which the electric field is parallel, perturbation is parallel to the equilibrium magnetic field. And the reason why it's called ordinary is because then the plasma responds as if there's no magnetic field because, you know, along the field, particle motion is free, uh, just, you know, you know, whereas perpendicular it's not. And so per people call the other type of mode where E is perpendicular B extraordinary out of the ordinary, other than ordinary something. Anyway, extraordinary. And that will be in the case where we have E perpendicular to B naught. Now, you can then see that we're having uh, a, a bit of terminology here, which is telling us that, in fact, there's going to be some wide variety of cases that we're going to have to treat when we get into a magnetized plasma you know, perp and parallel uh, to the magnetic field, transverse and longitudinal waves, and ordinary and extraordinary modes. So all of these things, in some sense, will be uh, various uh, particular uh, cases for a magnetized plasma. Now, so before we, uh, well, in order to do that, what we need to do is to derive the dielectric constant or tensor because it's anisotropic, it's directional dependent because the magnetic field 
determines direction in the plasma. Uh, and so what we need to do is derive somehow or other the dielectric constant for frequency waves, uh, waves of some frequency. And what we found was that, in fact, we could do that if we could derive the conductivity tensor, sigma. So what we want to do then next is we want to um, calculate the uh, conductivity, electrical conductivity. And actually, tensor is what it will be. Uh, because we have an anisotropic medium, B field points in, say, the Z direction almost always, and then there are these other directions, X and Y. And because particles move in various directions, we have to take account of the fact that, um, uh, well, uh, that there will be differences of responses in the various directions. Now, of course, what we mean by the conductivity tensor is that we expect to be calculating a current and the little hat, of course, means I mean as a function of frequency, not at zero frequency, is equal to the conductivity tensor uh, dot the electric field. So I've got to get some effective Ohm's law um, for my uh, particular plasma. Now, in order to do that, what I need to do is, cons oh, I'm sorry, I should have said for a magnetized plasma. Yeah, right. That's what we're trying to do it for, for a magnetized plasma. Now, in order to do this, what do I need? Well, we need to, you know, consider some assumptions. So let's say consider a cold. We always use the word cold to mean that what I'm going to do is I'm going to take T goes to zero, no temperature, okay? Uh, and then magnetized, and that's a catchword for saying that the equilibrium magnetic field is there, it's not equal to zero, or alternatively what I really mean is that the cyclotron frequency is not equal to zero, uh, plasma. And then, uh, so what we have in mind, uh, you know, is we have some, and it's going to be for simplicity, a uniform magnetic field, and so what we have in mind is that we just have some, uh, some magnetic field, equilibrium magnetic field, which will be taken to be typically in the z direction. So it could, I could write it as b naught z hat. And then, you know, I've got some plasma sitting on top of this, okay? And what we'd like to know is if I impose some wave structure or some electric field, you know, I stick in a probe and I uh, and I put an oscillate uh, put an oscillating voltage on it or something. What kind of waves do I launch? And obviously, they're likely to be different along the field than perpendicular to the field. Okay, so to do this, that is to say, to begin to develop this conductivity tensor, we need to, to consider a simple model. You know, uh, we'll make it as simple as we can. So the assumptions are first an infinite, infinite homogeneous homogeneous plasma and of course again what do I mean by infinite and homogeneous I really mean that on the gradient scale lengths if I had a, a density gradient or something that the distance over which the density varies by a factor of two let's say, is long compared to the Debye length or wavelengths or, or any one of those sorts of things. Second set of assumptions, uh, maybe I should say with, of course, now in equilibrium, B naught does not equal zero, but actually we will take V naught equals E naught is equal to zero. There's no equilibrium flows or uh, electric fields. But A second uh, will treat... Um, uh, the plasma as a fluid, plasma uh, treated, actually I should say as uh, some of electron and ion fluids. So, so we'll treat both electrons and ions with um, fluid equations. 
um, and we'll take t goes to zero, uh, no thermal effects. Again, that's just for simplicity, sort of as usual. Um, and finally, a, a sort of third key assumption is that we will take k per rho much less than 1. And what I mean by that is that we have a small gyro radius compared to perpendicular wavelengths uh, to the field. Um, so this will be a small, so-called small gyro radius expansion. And it's also the way in which we uh, solve particle orbits a little bit earlier. And so what uh, we mean by that uh, is that if I consider a particle gyrating around a field line here, you know, in its Larmor orbit, and if I have some wave uh, perpendicular to the field, okay, that the wavelength of that wave, uh, so maybe it's got a k in this direction, and the wavelength is then from here to here, that that wavelength perpendicular is very long compared to this small gyro radius. Okay? And we like that because that means I don't have to worry about the fact that the particles are actually gyrating perpendicular to the field line. It also, remember, since the gyro radius is proportional to the square root of temperature, okay, it's the velocity over the cyclotron frequency, and the velocity typical thermal speed is proportional to the square root of temperature, this approximation is consistent with having t goes to zero, no thermal effects. Okay, so what we need to do now is for this model, we need to solve for, uh, we need to somehow determine the current in response to an electric field. And we get the current by summing over the perturbed or oscillating or jiggled uh, flow velocities. So what we need to do is solve momentum and density and momentum conservation equations, look at those, and see if we can determine the fluctuating flow in response to a fluctuating electric field. So we do our, our standard sort of procedure here. Um, we consider fluid equations. And now what I will do in doing this is we'll consider them for both electrons and ions. But I will do it sort of generally, and therefore I won't bother to spell out that for the electrons the charge is minus E, and for the ions, for protons, Q sub I is plus E. We'll just use Q, and so we'll just kind of do it generically. So what we have as our fluid equations are that, uh, of course, we have density conservation equation, dN dt plus del dot nV is equal to zero. And then we have our uh, momentum balance equation, mn dv dt is equal to nq times uh, e plus v cross b. Since I have my b now, I have to worry about that. And then I might have this minus gamma t grad n. But again, uh, we're going to uh, neglect that particular term. So we'll... Uh, just neglect that. Now, the usual uh, first step in our process is to so-called linearize the equations. And remember what that means is we say the density is equal to some equilibrium plus a perturbation. So if we do that and we get the linearized version of the equations, we get dn dt plus n naught del dot v tilde is equal to zero. Uh, for the density equation, conservation equation, and for the momentum balance equation, we get uh, m n naught uh, dv tilde by dt is equal to n naught q times uh, e tilde plus v tilde cross v naught. We don't get a v naught cross B tilde because we didn't have any flow, didn't allow for any flow in equilibrium, so we don't need that term. 
Now, since n naught appears on both sides, we can actually get rid of that. And our next step is uh, is that we assume that you know e tilde n tilde v tilde uh, etc. all vary like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And what that tells us is that gradients go to i k and partial with respect to t's go to minus i omega. So with that in mind, we just uh, stick that in uh, up here, and our density balance equation then becomes minus i omega n tilde plus n naught i k dot v tilde is equal to zero, and our momentum balance equation becomes minus i omega m um, v tilde is equal to q times uh, e tilde plus v tilde cross v naught. And now if we uh, wanted, but we don't actually need it, but I'll still write it down, we would have that n tilde is equal to uh, k dot v tilde over omega times the equilibrium density. But the part we... Uh, kind of care about is this uh, momentum balance equation. Um, and I guess I'd like to leave it not, uh, not solve for V um, for the moment, uh, but rather just write that our momentum balance equation becomes minus I omega uh, times the mass times the flow velocity, perturbed flow velocity is equal to Q Lorentz force, basically, Q plus V tilde cross B naught. Now, uh, notice what we really wanted to do, or let's remember, was calculate the current in response to an electric field. And so we need to calculate the perturbed flow velocity if we apply a perturbed electric field. So that's what we're up to. And as in our single particle orbits uh, discussion, we will have to distinguish between those directions parallel to the magnetic field and those perpendicular. We don't really need, it turns out, the density perturbation. We only need the current. Maybe I should just write this down, that the perturbed current that we're interested in would be the sum over species of NQV. But since there's no flow in equilibrium, this has to be n naught j for the j species J is equal to electrons and ions. Uh, Qj for the charge of that species, and then the flow velocity J tilde. And I have not bothered to write J subscripts in this momentum balance equation because, you know, I just, when I need to, I'll put on the subscripts and specialize to either ions or electrons. But for the most part, I just keep track of both of them at the same time. It's uh, just as easy. So I don't need, it turns out, the n tilde. So really what I need to concentrate on is solving this momentum balance equation. Now, and how do I solve that? Well, I sort of dissect it into its parallel to the magnetic field parts and its perpendicular parts. And how do I go about that? Well, we, uh, so let's say, uh, split momentum balance into perpendicular and parallel to B naught parts. So for the parallel part, well, all I have to do is I take uh, B naught dot the momentum balance equation. Okay, that takes my parallel component. And I should have maybe mentioned again that we're going to, by convention in almost all of plasma physics, B naught is taken to be in the Z direction. Okay, uh, the Z direction is the direction of the equilibrium magnetic field. So, um, but we sometimes label parallel is equal to the Z direction. So sort of parallel hat is equal to Z hat. 
So if we do that, we take the parallel component of that equation, and we get minus I omega M V parallel tilde, or VZ tilde, would be equal to Q and then E parallel tilde. And then I might think I'd have a V cross B, but again, if I take B naught dot V cross B, that's, you know, Z dot Z cross something, so that vanishes. So this is all I get for the parallel motion. And this will be kind of uh, solved conveniently, and I'll put it back in VZ notation, as the perturbed field, perturbed flow along the field line caused by an electric field perturbation along the field line is then IQ over M omega times EZ tilde. And of course, I've used the fact here that 1 over minus i is i. Okay, so I flipped the sign there. Now, that again is essentially the same relationship as what I would have gotten if I didn't have a magnetic field, except it would have been vectorially true in all directions. Now, it's only true along the magnetic field. What happens uh, perpendicular? Well, that's a sort of more interesting story. And how do we treat perpendicular? Well, what we do is we always take B cross various things. Um, so the first thing we want to do is take minus B naught cross B naught cross. And you remember that and, and divide by B squared, B naught squared. And remember what that operator does is sort of changes everything into perpendicular operators. So what we actually get then is minus I omega M V perp tilde is equal to then, looking back up here, uh, Q E perp uh, plus, and now I could have put a V perp tilde cross V naught in there anyway because the only directions of interest are the perpendicular directions. So this is my perpendicular momentum balance equation. How do I go about solving it? Well, there's two ways to do it, two easy ways, let's put it that way. One is you can just directly split it into two directions perpendicular to the magnetic field. Since we chose the magnetic field to be in the z direction, those two directions would be, say, x and y. On the other hand, you can also solve it directly, factorially, and that's sort of the way I'll do it. And in order to do that, you know, we've got a little bit of a problem. We've got a, a direct V perp, and then we've got a cross product. So to, to, to kind of solve it, the thing to do would be I'd like to get some expression for V perp cross B naught. So how do I do that? Well, what I do is I take this equation and I cross it into b naught, and then I'll get a v perp cross b naught, and then I'll have to figure out what the rest of the stuff does. So what we do is uh, take the equation and cross it into b naught, and what that gives us then is minus i omega m v perp tilde cross b naught is equal to q, and I should have had a e perp tilde. Uh, E perp tilde cross B naught. And then we've got a V perp cross B naught. And that's crossed into B naught. Now, what's that last thing there? Well, we can also write this as minus B naught. I can just flip the order, okay? Cross V perp cross B naught. And I can flip once more the V perp and the B naught. And so this will be equal to plus B naught cross B naught cross V perp. And what is that? Well, once I get it to that, this is equal to, this is our sort of standard relationship for getting something perpendicular. 
but it's got a minus sign in it, so it's minus v naught squared v perp tilde. So, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I'm going to rewrite it so we can sort of see it too. <laughs> so our equation then, our cross equation here is minus i omega m v perp tilde cross b naught is equal to q and then uh, times e perp tilde cross b naught. And then what we found is this v cross b cross b has turned out to be none other than just minus b naught squared times v perp tilde. Okay, now that was what this little bit over here in the corner was. Now what good does that do us? Well, what we want to do is now substitute in this expression for v cross b back into this expression back here in the original equation. This is just cross b cross the original equation. And we'll see that that we'll get a, a, a little bit more complicated relation. So what we then get is minus i omega m v perp tilde. That's this part up here. This is going to be equal to q times e perp tilde. And now I perhaps should have you know, done the i omega here business, but uh, I'll stick it in now. 1 over minus i omega becomes i over omega. So what we can do is then make this plus, and I'm just now plugging in v cross b, so it would be plus q over, or plus i q over m omega, and then this becomes times e perp cross b naught, um, and then minus b naught squared v perp tilde. So all I've done is substitute in this expression for v cross b back into this relationship. We've got out a little bit long um, equation. Uh, so now what we can rewrite that then, again, dividing through by minus i omega m, we get i q over m. Um, Oh, I'm running down the bottom of the slide. Ah, we can get rid of that one for a moment now. So uh, we're getting uh, IQ over M, and then we're getting an E perp tilde. And this I can bring out, uh, or I can leave out in front an IQ over M. So we just get IQ over M omega, another one, so to speak, and E perp tilde cross B naught. And then it's, so it's, uh, let me sketch which terms are going where here. I uh, hope not, but I did. You're right. <laughs> Need a little omega in here, right? I was deceived by the one I had inside there. Okay, on my last term, uh, I'd like to write it a little bit differently. And so I'm going to get minus i uh, squared. 1i from inverting 1 over minus i, 1i from there, and then a q squared, and then I'm going to get two factors of mass and two factors of omega squared, and then we got b naught squared and v perp tilde. i squared is, of course, minus 1, so all of this, okay, just gives me a plus sign. Uh, what's QB over M? That was our good good old cyclotron frequency, right? QB naught over M. So that last term just becomes omega C squared over omega squared. So this total, total term this just becomes then plus omega C squared over omega squared times V perp tilde. And so I can take that over to the left-hand side. And what I'm then getting is that I have 1 minus omega c squared over omega squared times v perp tilde is equal to uh, i q over m omega times e perp 
tilde. And now here, uh, I have another Q over M, and I choose to write things a little bit differently. So I'll write this as I uh, QB naught over M and I over omega. And I pulled out a B naught to do that. So I need an E perp tilde cross B naught divided by B naught. And again, this quantity uh, is my cyclotron frequency, again. So sort of pulling all this together, okay, what we get is that we have V perp tilde is equal to IQ over M omega times E perp tilde plus I omega C over omega times E perp tilde cross B naught, all divided by the magnitude of B naught. And then this whole thing gets divided by this 1 minus omega C squared over uh, omega squared, a cyclotron resonance term, which I will write here as just divided by 1 minus omega C squared over omega squared. So that's the answer we sort of desired. And what am I going to uh, do with it? Well, you remember we wanted to find out that we were having an electric field perturbation in the plasma and what flow velocity did it cause was the question. And before that, we also had that, um, that the, this is the perpendicular flow velocity caused by a perpendicular electric field perturbation. And this was the parallel or Z component flow velocity caused by the um, parallel one. Now, actually, I see that before I do that totally, what I better do is on the perpendicular. This is general perpendicular, but now I'll really specialized to X, Y, Z uh, Cartesian coordinates, and we could have done that, but done that up that way, but it's good practice to do it with a vector way, let's put it that way. So uh, let's say in um, Cartesian coordinates, then um, we take our V perp here, and what we would have then is that Vx tilde, let's say, would be IQ over M omega. And now the E perp, if I take just the X hat component of this, that would be then the EX tilde, and then plus I omega C over omega. And if I want the X component of E cross B, B is in the Z direction, so it would be the EY, which I'd have to care about. So this is EY. Uh, and then this is divided by 1 minus omega c squared over omega squared. On the other hand, Vy tilde, the uh, next component would be IQ over m omega, Ey tilde. And now, e, uh, if I took Ex cross B and took then the Y component of that, that turns out to be a left-handed you know, triad. So it would actually be minus I omega C over omega times EX, all divided by 1 minus omega C squared over omega squared. And then finally, we have that VZ tilde was what we had before, namely it's IQ over M omega times EZ tilde. So those are our uh, three components. And uh, one thing I'd like to do here, though, is to note that 1 minus omega c squared over omega squared, I'll write in a moment as just clearing the omega squared downstairs as omega squared divided by omega squared minus omega c squared. Now, what we wanted to find out, the reason we got into this, was we wanted to find out the current in response to an electric field. But before that, I guess before that, I should say we'd like to find the what's called the mobility tensor. So the mobility tensor is defined 
as the flow in response to electric field. So let's write down a mobility tensor. And it's only true in perturbations here. But if I add up all these various pieces, then what I could do is say that V is going to be equal to, there's a common feature of um, I Q over M omega. And I'd like to construct now a matrix which would take account of all those things. And so what I would do uh, is, is first, this first part up here will just give me omega squared over omega squared minus omega c squared. And this will be dotted into the electric field. Uh, and then I'll have a, as an off, that, so that would be my EX tilde. So that's my 1, 1 component. And my sort of 1, 2 component will be I omega omega c divided by omega squared minus omega c squared. And then there's no elect velocity in the x direction. Maybe I should write this would be, of course, vx tilde, vy tilde, vz tilde. Sort of mixed notation here. Um, and there'd be no z component. So we'll have a z or a zero here. Um, and this is all going to be times a vector, ex tilde, ey tilde, and ez tilde. And that would sort of take care of that line. Then for vy tilde, it's only driven by ey, a sort of diagonal component. So that would be, again, omega squared divided by omega squared minus omega c squared. Z, the electric field in the Z direction doesn't, deri doesn't drive any flow velocity perturbation in the Y direction. But we again get this sort of off diagonal term, minus I omega, omega C, sometimes called whole terms, these off diagonal ones it turns out, by the way, is omega squared minus omega C squared. Um, so that sort of takes care of that part. And then finally, the EZ component the, sorry, the flow velocity in the z direction is only driven by the electric field in that same direction. So we could then write this as the velocity is equal to the what's often called the mobility tensor. So it's mobility tensor dotted into E tilde. So this would be called the mobility tensor. Tensor. And notice that it's actually a frequency, a function of frequency. And that mobility tensor would give, be given by, you know, this matrix, which is dimensionless with this coefficient IQ over M omega. Okay? So all this tells us is if we apply some electric field perturbation, this is the flow velocity it induces. Okay, what can we, uh, uh, oh, how do we calculate then the perturbed current? Well, we just have to add up these things, these perturbed flows for each species. And the cyclotron frequency, remember, depends upon which species I'm interested in, electrons or ions. Likewise, the charge and mass will be for any particular species. So let's uh, do that. So uh, let's calculate then the conductivity tensor, electrical Conductivity tensor. Conductivity tensor. Namely, we know that we have the perturbed current is equal to the sum over species of uh, n naught j q j v j tilde. Uh, j is the you know species index, which is electrons or ions. Uh, and we'd like to write that as the conductivity tensor, which will be a function of frequency, dotted into the electric field. Now, to do this, it's sort of convenient. Uh, let me just say it that way. If we look back at this, to remember at, at the form of this tensor, let's just 
recall as a sort of sidelight, let's call it, that, well, so if we multiply n q times velocity, what we're going to get is n naught j q j squared divided by m j. And that quantity is sort of familiar. Namely, if we would just write ourselves an epsilon naught down there, then this would be equal to the plasma frequency of that species. So this tells me that if I multiply nq to get, you know, I'll take my flow velocity here, flow velocity perturbation, multiply it by n naught q, uh, then that'll give me the nq squared over m. So actually what we could write is then that this will be um, the sum over j of i, and now I've got to put in an epsilon naught because I took out an epsilon naught there, and there's still an omega in the denominator, and then I'll have omega pj squared, and then I'm just going to write symbolically this big tensor, and uh, ex tilde, EY. I'll write this again so we can see it, but anyway, ey, ez. And now all of this stuff does not depend upon species, so we can bring that outside. And I can identify then all of this stuff here is going to be my conductivity tensor. And this is, you know, dotted into my electric field perturbation. So just using, again, the, the same um, tensor as before, but now I'll just write it out, our conductivity tensor as a function of frequency is equal to I epsilon naught over omega times the sum over species of the plasma frequency squared. And then we'll have um, omega squared divided by We'll have all these uh, great factors here, omega squared minus omega c squared, and then i omega omega c divided by omega squared minus omega c squared, and zero, just the same factors as before, minus i omega omega c divided by omega squared minus omega c squared, and then the diagonal term is omega squared over omega squared minus omega c squared, and 0, and 0, and 0, 1. So this is then our uh, conductivity uh, tensor. Um, and again, it's a tensor because, you know, it's the, the ZZ component is the as if the current driven along the field line caused by an electric field along the field line. And these are the diagonal ones, X current for an X electric field. And this is a whole term or an off-diagonal term of XY and YX. So it means that I apply an electric field perpendicular to the field that actually drives a current both in the direction of the electric field and perpendicular to that. So plasmas are very anisotropic media. Okay, what are we going to do with the conductivity? Well, what we do is we want to get a dielectric constant and a dispersion relation. How do we do that? Well, we've got to go back to Maxwell's equations. And I'll kind of go through this uh, quickly. Namely, uh, and we talked about this a good bit last time, but I just want to reiterate and get some stuff. So we had Gauss's law, del dot E is rho over epsilon naught. No magnetic monopoles, curl B, or del dot B is equal to zero. Faraday induction law, curl E is minus dB dt. And Ampere's law, curl J, curl B, sorry, is equal to mu naught uh, J plus. And now we have this little question of which way we want to do it, um, but uh, we will choose uh, the dd dt just so we can kind of see what's going on here, where d is equal to the displacement vector is epsilon, 
we're going to have in mind that it's epsilon dot e. It'll only be true for finite frequency modes. So what we do is linearize and do the um, and assume e to the i k dot x minus i omega t uh, perturbations. And once we do that, we get i k dot e is e, uh, tilde is equal to rho tilde over epsilon naught. I k dot b tilde is equal to zero. I uh, k cross e is equal to minus i omega b tilde. And I k cross b is really just repeating what we did last time. Mu naught j tilde plus um, well, minus I omega d tilde. Now, we didn't need, it turns out, this or this, and we just solved the Faraday induction law equation. It's getting a little on the weak side. Um, as B tilde is equal to 1 over omega uh, K cross E tilde, and then what we do is we substitute this into there. And what we get, as we did before, uh, is we get I over omega K cross K cross E tilde is equal to mu naught uh, J tilde minus I omega displacement vector tilde. Now, um, it's at this point that we fiddle around a bit is the only word I can use. Well, first off, we'll put that over there. Um, I guess I want to make this minus K cross K cross E tilde, and this will be equal to then uh, I omega mu naught uh, J tilde minus I omega D tilde. Uh, I, I think I've got the right signs here. Let me check. Uh, I want a minus sign, so I got a minus I, and then I take minus I over the denominator and flip it, and that becomes then plus I upstairs. Okay, now, uh, if you go through, okay, saying that, well, in one case with no plasma, D tilde is just epsilon E tilde, or alternatively, you say, no, really what it is is epsilon dielectric tensor dot E. And I give for my J that it's a conductivity tensor dot E. Then you can very readily, and I won't go through this again, we did it without doing it in tensor notation, but you can show that what you have is that the, you can represent your effective dielectric constant is epsilon naught times the identity tensor plus I over omega epsilon naught times the conductivity tensor. So this says if I know the electrical conductivity of the plasma, I can get the dielectric tensor. And you put that into this overall law, and what you get is your dispersion relation, which now has the form uh, k squared identity tensor minus omega squared over c squared times the dielectric tensor epsilon, and then minus k vector, k vector, all dotted into E tilde is equal to zero. So two sort of key relationships, which we'll uh, write down again in a moment, uh, is the relationship of the knowing the conductivity tensor, what the dielectric tensor is, and then putting that into our uh, wave equation here to get the normal mode uh, dispersion relation uh, for for the electric for the various normal modes in the plasma, and so. 
uh, will on the on the next slide here in a moment will come back to this and having derived this in general and having this particular rather complicated uh, conductivity tensor will then uh, do some special cases and look at some special limiting cases of this uh, so that we can one make sure we did the right things and two uh, take some special interesting physical situations. <laughs>